Australia has always been known to me as having the most batch cray cray bananas TV as a child. Uh, round the twist, anyone? Have strange things happen. Are you going round the twist? And what on earth is this? Hi, I'm Ave. It's Dexter. This is my skull. It's it's a skull. Also, mm, heartbreak high. Stop it! Stop it! Honestly, Australian Teen TV could have its own series on this channel. But today, I wanted to talk to you specifically about the iconic insanity that was Pugwall Summer. Pugwall, real name Peter Unwin George Wall, hence Pugwall, is a young lad who decides to form a band with his friends. So the series follows the trials and tribulations of this kid and his band, The Orange Organics, which to be fair is actually a really decent name for a band. <laughs> But that's where the decency stops. Now, I cannot tell a lie. This band, Orange Organics, may have been the sole reason I decided to get into music and start my own band when I was a kid. I should be more ashamed to say that. So I guess on some level, I'm grateful to Pugwall Summer, I think. Apparently the series is based on a book and I, I cannot fathom anybody writing this down in novel form. Okay, the positives. The theme tune was incredible and definitely the best thing about the show. To be honest, I'd say it's probably one of the best theme tunes going. Let's get into it. Nobody tells me what to say. Can't you see? I've got a dream, I'm gonna make it. If there's a chance, I'm gonna take it. With drums of thumping. Basic tub thumping. Keyboards and me on my guitar. Let's dive into the psychology of this theme tune. The fact that they did not bother with a second vocal take. They said, you know what? It's fine. It will do for now until eternity. It's absolutely fine. I've got a dream. I'm gonna make it. If there's a chance, I'm gonna take it. Now, you may be wondering, how on earth did I choose from all the iconic episodes available for the one to review today? Well, I remembered a song that I could not get out of my head for mm, several decades and I needed to retrace my steps to find out where it was from. It turns out it was from Pug All Summer, <laughs> which is how we arrived here in the first place. So I googled that song, some of the lyrics that I could remember, which led me to season two, episode one. <laughs> Trigger warning, severe racism and cultural appropriation. Australian TV just does not know when to stop. So the episode starts with Pugwall addressing the audience, which I always find a little bit unnerving. Zach does this in Saved by the Bell and Clarissa does it when she's explaining it all. And then we find out his band, The Orange Organics, have won a trip to Japan to record their song. And as soon as I heard the music that the writers of the show had come up with to signify that they were going to Japan, I knew we were in for a world of pain. We won a trip to Japan and a chance to record our song. And thanks to Aunt Annabelle. Anyway, his family also get to travel to Japan because of their Aunt Annabelle, but they don't really explain what it is the Aunt Annabelle has done. Is she the head of Qantas Airlines? Is she a member of the Hilton family? Like, what is it that Aunt Annabelle has done to make sure that the whole entire family can fly to Japan? We never find out. Pugwall has a... I was going to say a love-hate relationship with his sister, but really it's a hate-hate. He obviously finds her annoying. She's his little sister. Her name's Marion, but Pugwall's nickname for her is Marmaloid. So they're on the plane. The family is sitting in one section at the back and Pugwall and his bandmates are sitting further down the plane. So the sister decides to be really annoying and walk down the aisle to annoy Pugwall. Pugwall's reaction to this is very, um, aggressive. Just get lost. You're supposed to keep out of their way. Ah, let go of me. But what's even worse is the little sister saying this. Is something wrong here? Yes, this young man's molesting me. It's all right. She's my sister. All right. It's a bit much. We're literally two minutes into the show. But buckle up, people, it gets stranger. And then we meet the record company who are going to be hosting Pogwall and his band for their stay. And so begins the most uncomfortable viewing experience. <laughs> Some of the band are there dressed up in kimonos for no reason. And Pugwall begins speaking very slowly to a man, even though we've just heard that the man speaks perfectly good English. Orcs. Pugwall's girlfriend, I can't even remember her name. She's also the singer in the band. She is just constantly mute. Every now and then she offers up a smile or a giggle, but that's literally about it. It's very unnerving and it's giving, it's giving submissive wife. <laughs> 
So the band head for dinner to a traditional teppanyaki restaurant and immediately begin being mad disrespectful to the hosts. They're picking up their food and they're scrunching up their nose to things like seaweed. Pogwall's family manages to arrive at the same restaurant, even though there are plenty of restaurants in Japan. Out of respect for Pogwall, his parents and his sister decide to sit on another table so he can just be with his friends. But Pogwall and his sister Marma Lloyd can't help it and make really immature faces at each other from across the table. <laughs> for the love of God, please give this girl some lines. <laughs> So Pogwall's sister decides to bring McDonald's into the Japanese restaurant, which is, again, mad disrespectful. And all of Pogwall's friends are jealous because they're all Philistines and they can't bear to have a little bit of seaweed and what looks like delicious grilled prawns. Anyway, the band are in Japan so that they can record their singles. So they're in the recording studio and they're finding it really, really hard to get it together. It's like they've just suddenly lost all sense of all their faculties and they can no longer play their instruments in time, in tune. Surely there's not that much difference playing live and recording. As somebody who does do both, I can tell you there isn't that much difference. The producers are incredibly patient, but after 50 takes, they call it. But they still have a live concert that they've been booked for where they can claw some dignity back. And that they do. They perform this song called Uptown Tokyo, which, yeah, it's a bop. It's a bop. I can't lie. By phones or aeroplanes. Shoot. The same. So sadly, if you please, well, learn some Japanese. We'll need it when we go to Uptown Tokyo. Do you know what? That's actually not bad. What I love about this is that the bassist and the keyboard are singing their BVs with absolutely zero amplification. <laughs> love that for them. Anyway, their live show is a massive success and the crowd loves them. The thing about Pugwall Summer that I'd forgotten is there's so much dead air in the conversation. A good performer on stage is not necessarily a good performer in the recording studio. But we'll make it one day. Uh, when you do, let us know. There'll be moments where the characters are just talking with no sound design, just natural sound design that you would have. It's just dead air. Anyway, the record company executives basically say to Pugwall, although their show was a success and that they're great live, they can't record for shit. And basically the record company are like, thanks, K, bye. The Orange Organics, you know, to be fair on them, they take it pretty well. And having been dropped by a record label myself in the past, I, I would just like to say that they actually took that a lot better than I did. <laughs> So now they're back at the hotel room and a man with the worst Irish accent comes to talk to them. I'm told that your commitment with the record company is finished. He's basically a promoter and he tells the band that he has a proposition for them. Firstly, the exchange comes out of absolutely nowhere. And secondly, what is this? He says he wants to sign the band onto a tour of the Philippines and Southeast Asia. He gives them a contract to sign, but then seems to be a little bit put off or a little bit perturbed when he realises that Pugwall's family are in town and that Pugwall, being a minor, will have to talk it over with his family. So Pugwall calls his dad and his dad gets onto the Australian embassy and does some digging and finds out that this guy is a shark and has done this before and basically sent bands overseas to other places in Asia and they've done shows for him and then he's ended up not paying them. And therefore, Interpol and the FBI are after him. Mm, I'm sure they've got better things to do, but go off. Now, what happens next is, well, hmm, how do I put this? Something. A lot of the time in Pugwall Summer, there'll be like these dream sequences. It happens quite frequently and sometimes there's like bigger production value. Sometimes a bubble will just appear here and they'll be like, thoughts going on and other times it will be full-on scenes that they've shot separately so Pugwall starts to imagine what would have happened if they'd signed the contract and said yes to this Mr O'Shaughnessy guy music dancing laughing singing of course everyone's welcome come on let's go to the Offensive is an understatement. Also, this poor girl, is she okay? She does not want to be there. She doesn't want to be in the band. She doesn't want to be on set. Does she even want to be an actor? You could have just said no to season two. Anyway, the band end up back in Australia without having recorded their song. And Pugwall and his mute girlfriend are walking along and he's reminiscing on not making it in the music industry. But Pugwall is determined and he really believes in the band which I found triggering. <laughs> we then cut to Pugwall's mum, who seems to have mm, culturally appropriated everything that she could get her hands on. Konnichiwa. I can't walk very fast. 
fasten these sandals. But everything's ready for dinner. This is really doing too much. What were the writers thinking? Mama, this ain't it. They sit around the table to indulge in sushi? So Uncle Harry joins them for dinner. And I don't know who Uncle Harry is, but the way that the writers set this up, it's like we should all know who he is already. Puggles' mum's trying to get him to eat what everybody else is eating, but Uncle Harry's not having it and he really wants a steak. So he just basically throws his sushi on the floor underneath so that the cat can eat it. But Puggles' mum thinks that he's actually enjoying it when there's nothing on his plate. So she puts more on his plate. The way Puggles' dad digs out the sushi makes me feel a little bit queasy. It turns out that Uncle Harry is basically a crook and he was the one that tried to set up that dodgy guy, Mr. O'Shaughnessy, with Orange Organics. And basically the idea was that he would take a 10% cut of whatever the promoter got. That he would do that to his own nephew is wild, but <laughs> okay, because they could have been trafficked or anything. But Pugwall Summer has this other insane thing where when Pugwall is addressing us as the audience, so he's looking at the cameras, people in the background continue to have conversations silently. Uncle Harry's one of those people you just love to hate. It was great to watch him squirm and try and think up excuses to get him out of the pickle he was in. We weren't really mad with him. The hell? So they're randomly pointing like this instead of talking. Just let them just talk and, and turn the volume down. So Puggle's dad is getting a bit worried that his wife is going a little bit overboard with the whole Japanese shtick, you think? And he wants Auntie Annabelle to talk her out of it. Again, we don't know who Auntie Annabelle is. I don't know her from Adam, but she seems nice. So Auntie Annabelle apparently talks her out of it, but we don't really see this happening. We just see them all having a conversation. But I guess in that conversation, Auntie Annabelle says something that plants something in the mum's brain. Anyway, the next day, after about 10 seconds of meditating, Puggle's mum decides that being Japanese is not for her. <laughs> or appropriating Japanese culture isn't for her anymore. And she decides she wants to just go back to being normal. So we end the episode with Pugwall going for a walk on the beach and he sees his arch nemesis. Says, nemesis is? What's arch? If there's two arch nemesis, is it arch nemesis? Arch nemesis, that sounds right, doesn't it? Anyway, he sees his enemies <laughs> on the beach and they say, oh, it's good to have you back in Oz, which is obviously very out of character for them. And then they commit one of the worst crimes. They stick a note on Puggle's back. <laughs> and that's it. The episode ends. Suffice to say, I hated this. <laughs> I don't really get the tone of the show. I thought Round the Twist was bizarre, but this is it's so weird. How many seasons did it last for? I need to look that up. No character has any personality. I have no idea how the mum feels about the dad, how the dad feels about the daughter, how the daughter feels about the mum. The writing is so disjointed and bizarre. The conversations are stilted and I really struggle to find anything humorous in this at all. So I'm so sorry if this video was boring. However, the songs slap. The songs are amazing. Anyway, I'm not sure I'm going to watch another episode of this unless the public demands it, but please don't. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this more than I enjoyed watching the episode. I did come across the program Beauty and the Beast. There was a program called Beauty and the Beast that was 1987 and it looks wild. The episodes are about 45 minutes long, which is why I was like, for my mental health, I cannot sit through that. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed and I hope to see you back here next week with another video. In the meantime, you can check out some other videos here as well. Thanks for being here. Okay, bye. If you want more videos of teenage TV shows and some other stuff, subscribe.